Hello, everyone from sunny Berkeley. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion on the future of biotechnology. I'm Lauren Tijambri, the Assistant Dean of College Relations and Development here at the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley and our discussion facilitator for today. Today's event represents the launch of our new Berkeley Biotech Pharma ecosystem and of our greater initiative to introduce you to our Berkeley ecosystems. This academic year, we are looking to launch four new ecosystems focused on biotech pharma, energy, food tech, and advanced materials products and technologies. As part of these ecosystems, each fall and spring, we plan to host a series of panel discussions, casual conversations, and lightning talks, and to partner with our Berkeley Career Resource Center to provide you opportunities to connect with and advise and hire our bright students through co-hosting career panels, workshops, fairs, and on-campus recruiting. So please look to get to further connected and engaged with our students, faculty, and fellow alumni by participating in our Berkeley ecosystems. Now for a few logistical matters regarding today's discussion. Today's panel discussion is being recorded, as will all future events. In the coming days, we will find, you'll find today's recording and other relevant content hosted at ecosystems.berkeley.edu. Please feel free to view and share the content of our ecosystems with your colleagues and professional networks. We are also planning to field questions today towards the end of our panel discussion. So please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, to pose any thoughts or questions of our panelists throughout today's event. And finally, directly following our event, you will receive a short survey. Please take a moment to provide us feedback on today's discussion, but most importantly, to provide us input on future topics and engagement opportunities that you might be interested in participating in. Okay, it's time to kick off our panel discussion on the future of biotechnology by introducing today's panelists. Dr. Maria Fardis joined Iovens Biotherapeutics as president and CEO and was appointed to the board of directors in 2016. She has led the transformation of Iovens from early stage development to late stage company with multiple pivotal programs for T cell based therapies for solid tumors. Dr. Fardis received her PhD in organic chemistry from UC Berkeley. Uh, Dr. David Rabuka is the founder and CEO of Acrogen Biosciences, a company developing safe and efficient methods for gene editing therapy. David received his PhD in chemistry at UC Berkeley. And prior to pursuing his PhD, David worked at the Burham Institute, synthesizing complex glycons and later at Optimer Pharmaceuticals which he joined as an early employee focused on the development of glycan and microlide based antibiotics. Dr. Dave Schaefer is a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering, bioengineering and neuroscience at UC Berkeley, where he also serves as the director of Berkeley Stem Cell Center. At Berkeley, Dr. Schaefer applies engineering principles to enhance stem cell and gene therapy approaches for neuroregeneration. Dr. Schaefer received his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT and is the co-founder and chief scientific advisor of 4D, 4D Molecular Therapeutics that develops AAV vectors to maximize upon gene therapies. And finally, our fourth panelist, Dr. Steve Warland, president, CEO, and director of eVectors Therapeutics, regrettably had a last minute uh, conflict arise and is unable to participate in our panel discussion today. So, Let's kick off today's panel discussion with having each of you briefly describe in a two to three minute elevator pitch, what research project or initiative are you currently working on that most excites you and why does it excite you so much? Maria, would you be willing to kick us off? Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, Iovance is working on cell development of cell therapies for solid tumors. Some of you might have um, monitored the landscape of treatment. We started some few decades ago with focus on small molecules, um, even started with natural products. I worked, um, I was a medicinal chemist, and so I worked on a number of different small molecules for antibiotics or various um, HIV, HBV, HCV project in a company in Bay Area called Gilead. And then over the course of the decades, we watched antibody development really blossom and we moved to antibodies becoming standard of care. And um, really that, that was transformative in terms of uh, tools that we use for treatment of various diseases. 
Um, a, a new wave of therapeutics has been cell therapy and cell and gene therapy, and I think my panelists are also going to talk about a very similar story. The so cell and gene therapy concepts have started with an autologous concept, which is our own cells, either from a genetic perspective, gene therapies, you know, change those cells. And in case of cell therapies, which is what we work on is we use the, the same cells from patients. We believe that our own immune system has the capacity to fight certain diseases, such as cancer. We amplify these cells and we rejuvenate them outside of human body. And then we put those billions of cells back into the patient. So IOVANCE is in the business of developing cell therapy for specific cancers. We are focusing on melanoma as our first indication, and then subsequently on cervical, head and neck, non-small cell as subsequent indication. That's fascinating, Maria. Um, David, do you want to answer uh, what, what project or initiative are you currently working on that excites you most and why? Um, sure. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to give a handful of projects because I've got a, a number of things that excite me. All, all, all super interesting. So when I, after I finished my PhD at Berkeley, I started a company called Redwood Bioscience with Carolyn Bertozzi, and it was a, a conjugate company. Um, and we, over the next few years, ended up developing some um, interesting uh, cancer drugs. The modality is uh, antibody drug conjugate. So we're basically, we were basically chemically tethering very potent, um, very potent cytotoxins to to antibodies that would specifically target uh, proteins overexpressed on a tumor, for example. Uh, and so we started that company and eventually it got acquired by Catalan uh, Pharma Solutions and I stayed on there for a number of years. Uh, and during that time, we were able to go through sort of the regulatory manufacturing and some of the, the challenges of drug development. And we now have some of these conjugates now uh, in the clinic. Um, and uh, targeting, um, so, uh, targeting blood-borne cancers. Uh, so that's been really exciting, and I still, I still uh, consult for Catalan, and I work with Catalan on those projects. Um, in the meantime, I also uh, started working with uh, Berkeley Catalyst Fund, which I have on my, on my backdrop, and that's a super interesting uh, small venture fund that is very focused on uh, helping uh, ideas be translated from the bench top to to uh, you know to products uh, specifically focusing on the, the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley and so um, I'm a venture partner there and and the fun thing about that is I get to see a lot of very cool ideas coming out of the out of the department and uh, and if I can help them uh, build companies around that I will and then finally uh, I'm actually I started another company called Acrogen Biosciences. This is a gene editing company, so many of you will be familiar with CRISPR Cas systems. Um, that's what we are, are leveraging. Um, my co-founder is a professor out of UCSF called Joe Bondi Denemy. And uh, a number of years ago, he started to discover um, small viral peptides that had evolved to circumvent the CRISPR-Cas system in a bacteria. So it, it's naturally found as sort of like the immune system for bacteria as they fend off sort of bacteriophage invasion. Um, and so the viruses, again, promptly decided to evolve uh, ways around that. And one of the systems they evolved are these small peptides. So we decided to take those and we're further engineering them uh, and building them into uh, sort of biological switches where we're able to temporally control an on-off switching process. And, and so we feel like this is going to be really relevant um, for developing safe in vivo applications of a CRISPR-Cas system for therapeutics. Um, and so that's what we're, we're working on there. So, so my interests sort of span the gamut, but that's, that's currently what I'm up to these days. That's great, David. Uh, and thank you for the plug for the Berkeley Catalyst Fund. It's always great to hear uh, uh, you know, a promotion for our, for our venture arm, uh, so to speak. Uh, and Dave, uh, what about you? What are, what are you working on these days uh, that is exciting you the most? Sure, I've, um, I've had a long-standing interest in really three parallel technologies, and we're going to see I have a lot in common um, interest-wise with our co-panelists. Uh, we work with gene therapies, genome engineering, and cell therapies. And uh, I've been at Berkeley for 21 years now, um, but I've been working in the gene therapy field for about 27 years in, in some so in general, we, we like taking on what would be viewed at the time that we start at least working with it, high-risk technologies, and uh, trying to, to apply engineering principles and molecular engineering concepts towards uh, solving problems within these fields. And then I also, once the, the field is sufficiently mature, the technology is ready, 
I really personally enjoy being involved in the transition of that technology from the, uh, the, private, sec the private sector into the public sector, sorry, from uh, academia into industry. And so I've uh, personally uh, co-founded six companies and maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about one of these, uh, 4D molecular therapeutics, which you mentioned in, in the intro. That was based on technology that I started in the College of Chemistry back in 1999 when I, when I started my lab. And uh, gene therapy at that point was uh, viewed as extremely high risk. And one of the biggest problems in the field at that time and currently as well has been delivery. You know, how do you get a chunk of, med of medicinal DNA into enough cells within a tissue to begin to alleviate disease symptoms, to, to be able to treat a disease. And the delivery technologies have um, progressively improved and we began to develop a platform for doing so in a very effective and high throughput way. So another alum from the College of Chemistry, uh, Francis Arnold, uh, who graduated from chemical and biomolecular engineering with her PhD back in the 80s, uh, moved on to Caltech. I'm sorry? Nobel laureate as well. Yes, exactly. Uh, so she moved to Caltech and then invented this concept of using evolution as a tool to engineer better biomolecules. Uh, this concept of directed evolution where you artificially create a very large gene pool, um, encoding a particular molecule, and then perform high throughput functional selections, Darwinian selections to, to isolate the fittest. So for this, like you mentioned, she won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. So we began when I got to Berkeley um, in 99, applying that concept to problems in gene therapy and started taking viral vehicles, which at the time looked somewhat promising. Uh, so specifically this virus that nobody's ever heard of because it's not a human pathogen uh, called adeno-associated virus or AAV. And we started using genetic diversification tools to create a library, which now in some total is about a billion new variants of AAV. And then we perform high throughput selections, typically in vivo, to identify the best ones to be able to deliver DNA to any, in principle, cell or tissue target in the body. So once we have that highly optimized delivery vehicle, we can load it with a chunk of DNA medicine and deliver it to those tissues to begin to try to treat disease. So uh, this, this technology was spun into the, uh, into the private sector back in 2013 when I co-founded with another Berkeley uh, alum, uh, this company 4D Molecular Therapeutics. And so seven years later, the company has grown to almost 100 people. We have two human clinical trials, a phase one, two clinical trials that we recently initiated. And we look forward to beginning to get efficacy data out of those trials within a matter of the next several months. Wow, very exciting stuff. I mean, all of you are uh, frankly on the cutting edge of, of biotech pharma and, and clearly why we have you uh, today as our panelists. Uh, there's some exciting things going on. Uh, let's take a moment to talk about macro trends. Um, I'd just be curious from your guys' perspective, you have a lot of experience in biotech pharma. What are some of the latest innovations and trends that you see transpiring in the biotech pharma space that most excite or concern you? Uh, David, why don't you take a first stab at that? Um, sure. So, so one of the things that I am very excited about is um, how synthetic biology tools are starting to come into their own and to be sort of uh, leveraged in, in very practical ways certainly in the material space. Um, but the food science has got me very excited as well. And so I think we've seen like an explosion of really interesting uh, companies developing uh, some, some nice alternatives to what, you know, we'd, what we'd seen in the past. So I think that, that's been pretty interesting. Then that ties into sort of uh, biomaterials and biomaterials being leveraged in spaces that um, previously no one had really gone after uh, and you're starting to see those evolve um, and grow and get capitalized to be perfectly frank people investors are now willing to put money into that so so I, I like that a lot um, you know back to Dave's comments about what he's been doing I feel like the whole delivery of biomolecules is very much on the cutting edge of what's happening now and the tools are now robust enough that you're starting to see real interesting applications, both from a therapeutic perspective, but then also from, um, you know, a more biotech materials perspective. So, so the things like the AAV development, I'm very excited about. I think that the idea of finally having the tools to start doing gene editing and gene therapy is obviously something that I'm very excited about and, and following carefully. Um, 
And then not just, so just the other big one, of course, is cell therapy, I think has just really exploded. And well, I was obviously we share a lot more about that today. Um, and I'm very excited about the promise of that. Uh, so I think I've covered like everything, but that, I mean, I'm excited <laughs> about everything. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Dave and Maria will have stuff to add, but, and, and also, uh, you know, that is one of the reasons why one of our first initial uh, ecosystems is focusing on food tech, because the food science area is really exploding and there's some fascinating new innovations there. So we hope to host uh, future panel discussions as part of that ecosystem on food tech. Uh, Dave, what, what would you add to kind of the, the macro trends at play now? Sure. Well, I, I feel one very powerful set of technologies is well represented within this panel that if you take a look at the history of pharmaceutical development, of course, the field started out with small molecules. And then, uh, you know, protein therapies emerged relatively early with insulin and obviously have exploded over the past two to three decades with monoclonal antibodies. And proteins and small molecules function by, you know, seeking inside the body a drug target binding to it and typically inhibiting its function. And that drug target is typically a, a protein. Uh, so these are temporary resonance of the body. They have a limited pharmacokinetic half-life, if you will. And one thing that the panelists share in common is that we view as a drug target, not another protein, but actually a piece of DNA. So I'm interested in delivering DNA. David is interested in modifying endogenous DNA. And Maria is interested in adding brand new genomes, brand new DNA in the form of new cell therapies to the body. And unlike a small molecule or a, an antibi a antibody or a protein therapy, DNA has the potential to become a permanent part of an organ or a tissue. So for the first time, it really in human biotech and pharmaceutical development, we can begin to at least be tantalized by the idea of one and done, you know, single treatment, long-term therapeutic benefit, or, you know, dare we at some point start using the word cure. So I think using DNA as a drug target where you're really permanently adding the potential to benefit a patient um, into the body, uh, really has the potential to revolutionize medicine. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to be, a, to be alive during the next couple of decades. <laughs> and still after all those years at Berkeley and in biotech, you're, you're, it sounds like you're still excited by the, uh, the trends that things are going. Yes, it's been a long road, of course. I mean, one of the jokes is that uh, gene therapy took 20 years to become an overnight success. Um, but, uh, you know, all that means is that it, it's taken the collective effort of thousands of people working for, for many years in order to begin to get the successes that we're seeing today. That's great. And Maria, what would you add in terms of the kind of macro trends and innovations that you see that you're either excited or concerned about? I actually very much echo what both Dave and David said. I think that um, they, they have their finger on the pulse of what is new and exciting. Um, I agree, cell and gene therapy, obviously I'm, I'm in the field, so I'm a little biased. Cell and gene therapy, I think, is, um, is quite pioneered next wave of therapeutics. Um, I guess for me, the focus is mostly on therapeutics for various diseases. So in addition to cell and gene therapies, I think that a, a wave or a revisit of targeted therapies has always been interesting, but we have now learned more about how to subcategorized diseases. A great example is non-small cell lung cancer. We have learned how there's specific driver mutations and how to exquisitely target them. And this is a beautiful space. I'm a medicinal chemistry a chemist and got my organic chemistry degree at Berkeley. So this is a beautiful example of what a few decades later we can use our you know, chemistry skills to design targeted therapeutics for these subpopulations of patients. So targeted therapies, I think, are, are still very much of interest um, for the chemists in the audience, I very much encourage you to pursue that. Um, and again, in addition to cell and gene therapy, which of course is very high up in my uh, area of interest, and I think it's, it's the next wave of therapeutics, ADCs have become um, a thing. I don't know if you've been watching recent acquisitions, MNA in that space has heated up. There's a lot of interest in antibody drug conjugates as therapeutics, and I think that these are also very exciting next generation products that are coming into market. Um, there's been a renewed interest in cytokines. Um, cytokines used to be of interest. They somewhat fell out of interest, as a matter of fact, because they are not easy to treat. But I think what we have learned as a general therapy is um, we, for the longest time, we were going for very safe and effective therapeutics, the so things that are oral once a day. Um, and again, we were all targeting, just put it in, the, in a bottle and give it to the patient and be done with it. 
we've now learned that, you know, if you have an efficacious therapeutic, you can administer this in a hospital setting. And if you are able to administer, I very much echo what Dave said, the once and done deal is something that you're very much pursuing. So in light of being able to have some degree of tolerance for adverse events and being able to manage those, um, therapeutics like cytokines have come back and they're be becoming again a, a target of interest. So collectively, I think we're very interested in um, complicated therapies. We have gone from a more simple therapeutic, one target, one you know medication, put in a bottle, give it to the patient, or infuse it IV to much more complex therapeutics uh, administered either um, at a site of care in a hospital or you know send the patient home and still monitor for adverse events and uh, and so forth. Um, hopefully, that summarizes it a little bit. That's great. Well, I want to kind of push the boundaries on where we see biotech pharma going because no doubt you know machines are getting faster and smarter data is becoming more plentiful i mean we have more data than frankly sometimes we know what to do with and i wonder from your guys perspective how do you see artificial intelligence computer and data science robotics being applied to advance the biotech pharma industries um maria would you be willing to take a first stab at that Absolutely. Right. I think it was Dave's um, turn. Was it uh, Dave? Actually, Dave, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Either either way works is uh, great with me. Okay. We'll go Dave and then Maria. We'll, we'll keep yeah. in the same pattern. Okay. Uh, so, you know, several major innovations in the biotech and the biology space over the past 10 years have been nucleic acid sequence. That has been enormous um, as, a, as an experimental capability. You know, pioneered by companies like Illumina, PacBio, um, Oxford Nanopore. So now, you know, whereas the first uh, public human genome sequencing project on James Watson's genome took, you know, on the order of a decade uh, for completion, now you can sequence people's genomes over the course of, you know, several days and uh, can do it in, in core facilities that are plentiful on campuses, including on Berkeley. Uh, so that has just generated an enormous amount of data, um, genome sequence wise. And in addition, um, uh, imaging capabilities have also generated huge amounts of data, data you know, where we've uh, evolved from uh, you know, a, a field computationally where we used to carry around our data on um, floppy disks to the internet, and now we're carrying around our data on hard drives in the, you know, in the backpacks of graduate students bicycling around campus because the internet's not fast enough to transfer these data. Uh, so, of course, then the next question is, what do you do with the data? How do you extract meaning out of all of that information? And that's where, you know, the second, I think second major innovation in biology has come, which is uh, computation. And so we, we have situations now where we can empirically take large data sets that correlate um, information with biological function and then train algorithms, of course, to make predictions about the relationships between those two. And once you have a trained algorithm, then you can start to make predictions about things that weren't even within your, your experimental data set to begin with. Uh, so it becomes a very powerful way uh, to use computation and machine learning for optimization uh, and prediction of biological function. Uh, so we've been doing this actually with that same work I mentioned to you um, on, on viral engineering. There's an incredible computer scientist on our campus uh, by the name of Jennifer Liskarten, who um, thankfully came to us after launching a very successful career at IBM. And so Jennifer and I have been collaborating on using sequencing of viruses and machine learning to be able to develop predictive algorithms for what AEV viruses um, would be the best gene delivery vehicles for any particular tissue target or cell target. And uh, you know, armed with those computational approaches, you can then make you know, concrete experimental predictions about how to design the system uh, to be able to get better performance. So that's just one specific example, but uh, AI and ML have entered into many facets of biotech, um, anywhere from drug discovery to, to biomolecular design. So it sounds like your work is uh, really going to lift off in some sense with the new data science program uh, building up at Berkeley. So that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm thrilled to see that program, you know, launching uh, with a new building that's going to be uh, arriving on campus over the next couple of years, especially. That's right. And Maria, what about you? Uh, how do you see kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science um, kind of advancing our field? Um, great, great topic, actually. This is absolutely a field that is looking like it's going to explode. 
uh, as Dave noted, it is um, extensively used in the field that we are in for specifically for solid tumors. This is a field that a number of companies are trying to understand and predict um, what is a specific new antigen or antigen peptide that a patient's tumor cells is presenting to our immune system. So this has actually been a field that is very, very targeted, has stemmed probably tens of companies being uh, established around how can we predict what is a specific peptide and how do we target that specific peptide. Um, we're still at the early stages in the solid tumor field. We have not made, made it very, uh, we have not been able to quite understand what is that specific peptide yet. And the patients are so heterogeneous between, um, in solid tumors specifically. Uh, and so the diversity of that peptide that is being presented on the surface of MHC to the you know, tumors, to the, our own immune system is quite high. Um, multiple institutions have tried to figure out what it is, institutions, academic, as well as industry. Industry has not quite figured out, uh, you know, how to well predict it in the, in the case of uh, academic institutions. NCI has been doing this. As a matter of fact, they've been doing whole exome sequencing, trying to figure out what is the specific peptide that one can target or a specific group of peptides that one can target and grow T cells against. So, so I think that, um, we are in the early stages and there's so much one can do. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement around it. And I think the next, I'm, I very much echo what they said. Uh, I'm really glad to be in science field nowadays. I think the next five to 10 years is absolutely going to explode in this field. Uh, it's incredible to have the capacity uh, of the amount of data that we can carry nowadays and being able to analyze them as quickly as we can. So very exciting. If anyone's in the field, stay with it. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of a lot of exciting changes, uh, I think, on the forefront. And, and David, uh, you know, particularly from your venture capital arm, I imagine you must see some exciting uh, innovations happening here with machine learning and, and AI. Um, what what do you see kind of transpiring? Um, so I think the the wave has already started to build, and so you know there are you know many many startups and many many small companies that are taking what basically comes out of tech, right? So tech's been doing this for a while. So they're taking, they're pulling, they're pulling the algorithms and some of the coding and some of the machine learning and then beginning to apply it to large uh, bio data sets, you know, metagenomic mining, you know, it's, so you're, you, you now have these huge data sets um, and you're seeing many companies do this. What is, what surprised me is that, um, you know, how, how accessible, you know, getting your hands on some of these algorithms are and, and how um, sort of democratized some of this, uh, this, some of the sort of coding and algorithm is. Uh, and so you start to see it pop up in places that you don't usually, you wouldn't expect. Um, and I'm certainly seeing it in, in drug discovery, um, you know, kind of going all the way back to combinatorial chemistry and then pulling out those big data sets and starting to think about those, being able to like uh, run and explore very large data sets around uh, biological pathways, um, very, very powerful tools. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm super excited about this. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of very innovative uh, entrepreneurs start to make these um, connections between um, you know, very disparate fields and then combining them into things that are going to be really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very exciting. And, and frankly, hopefully we'll, we'll speed up our learning curve, um, and discovery curve. Um, I want to change gears in the sense of, uh, I'm sure I'm safe to say that we have all been greatly affected by the recent global pandemic and particularly in the fields of, you know, creating vaccines and testing and uh, treatment. Um, how, what, what has been the biotech pharma industry is like, what, what have been the learnings from the recent COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, what have we, what have we learned? How is the biotech pharma industry becoming better because of what we've learned? Um, Maria, would you be willing to take a first stab at it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we have learned a lot. We have learned um, that remote employees can still be effective. We have always done this, but not to this massive degree that we are doing today. 
we have learned how to make sure that we have infrastructure to support everybody being remote. Um, we have learned on the operational level, we have learned, we, we run clinical trials, and so it, a real problem has been you know, patient retention and assuring that they're able to be assessed in this schedule that is called the schedule of assessment for our protocols. We have learned to uh, allow these patients to be assessed remotely, and we have learned what else we need to do for these remote assessments to be successful. Um, in many of our diseases, we have to have central read of scans, and so these scans have to have a certain quality, for example, and a site that may be a remote site may or may not have that same quality of assessment. So we need to learn how to be flexible uh, in terms of availability of the data that ultimately becomes your primary endpoint of the studies. We have learned that we um, have always historically wanted our data to be monitored 100%. Um, it's called on-site monitoring. We have learned that we have to figure out how to adapt and we will not have 100% of our data monitored. There has always been this concept of risk-based monitoring, but we haven't really adopted that as an industry heavily. <clears throat> and so we, we are now sort of thinking, okay, we should go back and polish up those risk-based monitoring guidances that FDA has put before us. And we haven't really as an industry adopted it heavily yet. Um, I think we have learned, and I think FDA supports that, is um, how to handle missing data. We are going to have missing data. A patient may or may not want to come back to a clinical site. Uh, in light of the fact that we have a one-time treatment that we offer, uh, it's not a chronic therapy, this is an even more complicated challenge because the patient may receive the therapy and chances of them coming back if they're feeling well um, is low. And we have to understand how do we address this? This is actually a story of success. How do we address this with regulators and how do we assure that we are able to give them enough data to convince them that if a patient didn't come back, it may or may not be due to progression or anything else. It may be due to the fact that they're benefiting from the therapy. So it's been, it's been quite wide in the sense of, you know, there's employee factors to it. There's the um, a morale aspect to it that we're not there all at the same time anymore. We don't see each other. We can walk to each other's office and sort of have a chat uh, sort of spontaneously. And unfortunately, we are missing those human interactions. But at the same time, we have learned um, and we continue learning how to get the business continuing and, and move forward. And I think that we have learned that there's gaps. There's gaps in our process of data collection, data verification, and provision to regulators. And we need to figure out how to address those in the upcoming years. Hmm. Yes, I think, well, first of all, we are missing those in-person interactions. I wish we were having this panel discussion together uh, in a classroom uh, setting, but uh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, David, would you want to build on that? I mean, what do you feel the biotech pharma industry has learned from, from this recent global pandemic? Um, yeah, so, so a couple things. Um, I think we've learned that we can do a lot of interesting and important meetings remote, which surprised me. Um, and, you know, again, coming from a slightly different angle, uh, I've been very pleased to see, you know, innovative startups coming out of Berkeley able to raise funds over Zoom, which um, I was not sure how that was going to go because, again, it is, that is kind of a relationship building piece. Um, you know, how companies have functioned uh, and, and had to add flexibility. Uh, I think the biotech community has done that very, very well uh, in terms of addressing uh, employee safety, but, you know, still being in the lab and generating science and doing it in a smart and thoughtful way. Conferences are interesting. Um, they're not as interesting as they used to be, right? It's, uh, you get really good data, but you don't get that networking. You know, you don't get the poster sessions, which was so good. So that's been, I think, um, maybe more challenging for, for, for folks. It's like, how do you communicate your ideas? How do you share, you know, innovation and, you know, your latest and greatest research? Um, and how do you do it in a way that, that allows you to continue to grow and network within your community of, of specialists or, or, you know, your, your fellow postdocs or whatever it's going to be? Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, the, the, the virtual conferences are just, um, they're, they're just lacking. And that's the one thing that I feel like we've been able to address a lot of, um, you know, meetings and we've still maintained efficiency and stuff, but, the, but the, there's just something special about, you know, having a beer at a poster session with a bunch of fellow scientists that you just can't replicate on Zoom. Um, 
So that's, that's you know, that, that is what it is and then that'll continue for a while. But um, I think the challenge is gonna be how do, you, how, do you, how do you build collaborations? How do you build a community, a network of, 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 of scientists where there's like a, a meaningful back and forth exchange of ideas, like a whiteboard, like a virtual, like the virtual whiteboards don't seem to work that well. You know what I mean? It's like, you just wanna be all around a table kind of talking. So that's been different and that's been difficult. Um, on another note, though, I think that, I, you know, I want to point out that I, one thing that really amazed me was how fast pharma and biotech were able to pivot to begin to address the pandemic and, and did it in a way that was very coordinated. Um, and, you know, they really were able to throw resources behind, um, you know, programs to move them rapidly. I, I think that's been unprecedented at least that in, you know, in my lifetime, seeing that kind of coordination. And, and I think that's, that, that's been really exciting to, to watch. Um, and again, overcoming just a lot of hurdles and there's a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of different countries, um, you know, all coordinating uh, and really focusing um, on, a, on, a, on a very pressing problem. Uh, and I think that, that you know, that, that um, really reflects well on our industry, right? At the end of the day, you know, if we can manage and uh, pull our, hor our intellectual horsepower and know-how together to solve big problems for, for humanity, I think that's, you know, that's a great outcome and that's what we all want. So that's been fun to watch from the, you know, just the industry rallying around a, a very big problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, it is exciting to see, uh, in some sense, the horse race right now that's going on to see uh, who will produce the, the, the vaccine that will have the, the biggest, uh, you know, uh, change for our, for our health um, uh, globally. And, and David, I just want to make sure, you know, next time you're on the Berkeley campus and we don't have to wear masks, I'll buy you that beer, okay? <laughs> awesome. Uh, That'd be perfect. <laughs> Uh, Dave, what about you? What have you seen from your perspective of how the industry has, you know, what, what have we learned or how, what, what do we need to learn uh, from this global pandemic? Yeah, I guess uh, one, one minor uh, follow up after a comment that David made that I liked, uh, which is that I think, in, you know, we're in Zoom all day, right? Uh, in Zoom with, with colleagues on campus, with, with companies that I interact with. And a lot of those sort of pairwise or small number of people meetings I've found to be reasonably effective still. It's when it gets large that it's, it becomes really un unwieldy. So how do you have a happy hour online, for example? Um, we all see it, but you know, only one person out of 30 can talk at a time and it's just not the same. And then in addition, you know, we saw you know, about 10 years ago or so, there was this discussion about MOOCs, you know, massively open online courses and this was gonna completely change the way that education was delivered in a way that you know, we, we might, in some cases, question the university model for education, if you could deliver this all online massively. And that never panned out because people learn better in person than they do remotely disconnected on a computer. And so there's, you know, for large gatherings, um, yeah, there is no substitute. Um, I also wanted to, to you know, further um, provide some thoughts on that discussion about advances in the technology in the field. And I, you know, I almost get a sense that the biotech and pharma fields didn't know how good they had become. And the, the way that people used to decide on designing the flu vaccine is that, you know, they're on order of 100 surveillance centers across the globe that collect influenza strains and um, twice a year, once for the nor northern hemisphere, once for the southern hemisphere, they distribute these samples to the World Health Organization and they make some decision or judgment about which ones are going to be the dominant strains that year and then design multivalent vaccines uh, to, to address them. And historically, they would then ship these vaccine, you know, influenza materials for manufacturing in, you know, cutting edge processes such as putting them into chicken eggs. And there was a huge mobilization to be able to get enough dosages together to, to treat the world. Um, that's completely changed with, with modern, you know, nucleic acid technology and molecular biology. So I think it was January 11th when investigators in China first reported a sequence for the coronavirus, for SARS coronavirus 2. Within, and I'm just going to pick on Moderna for a second. Uh, it was a company that was co-founded out of my, uh, my alma mater, MIT, uh, by, by a chemical engineer, Bob Langer. And so within two days, they'd already chosen what the sequence would be of their nucleic acid vaccine. Within three and a half weeks, they had synthesized the first batch of it for human clinical testing 
and within six weeks, it sent that material to the, uh, to the NIH, one of their clinical sites, to initiate the phase one. And so now there are seven vaccines in, a, in phase three clinical testing, including Moderna's and, and Pfizer's, which are probably, Pfizer appears to be the most advanced. And uh, both of these are based upon synthetic nucleic acids, where you get a sequence over the web, you synthesize it um, from DNA and then, and then RNA transcription. And uh, that becomes your molecular medicine. So compared to how it used to be done, it's just greatly accelerated and empowered by, by modern biology and biotechnology. So I'm sure that all of us have our fingers crossed that once uh, January, February rolls around, we're gonna start seeing vials shipped um, broadly. But uh, I don't think anybody would have imagined that that could have occurred within a year of the, the discovery of this, this, uh, this pandemic. Yeah, well, Thank you all for your insights. I, yeah, I agree that we are all we are all in a holding pattern right now, waiting for that vaccine to be to be created and distributed. But it it does seem um, quite amazing how how public and private sector and government have all uh, collaborated together to push things forward as fast as possible. Yeah, I think um, I think yeah, what gets lost in the discussion a little bit is just how how amazing that process has been just to reiterate what what Dave said because I, I feel like sometimes the general public doesn't fully like they're just not they just aren't informed on what a what a, a typical trial would look like and 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 you know the resources involved and so they're seeing it for the first time in the bright lights and it is worth emphasizing I think to people just how incredible uh, this process has been and the progress has been because I, I feel like you know, maybe the industry is not getting a lot of credit right now. They're getting beat up a little bit about this, but it's like they should, this is, it's been a pretty amazing journey to watch. Yeah. Well, why don't we change gears a little bit? We have a few questions that have been posed. So I thought that would be a, a good time for us to kind of uh, grab a few of these. Um, here's a question from Todd. It says, given individual genome diversity, how concerned are you about the challenges of prospective off-target effects in cell and gene therapies? Yeah, should, uh, I can talk on the gene therapy side. Sure. Um, yeah, it is, it is a significant concern, um, certainly, that, uh, of course, uh, individual genetics affects how somebody responds to a drug. And uh, you know, that's, that's part of the basis for running larger randomized clinical trials so that you can see the full spectrum of responses, both um, positive or, or in some cases negative, if they're, they're adverse events that emerge. Uh, so you can't predict what's going to happen across the, you know, the general large population once a drug is more broadly used in a way that's larger than, than the phase three. But uh, by and large, uh, at least within my field, the, the performance in phase threes has been pretty predictive of how it's worked in the, in the general population. Uh, you test it as, as much as you can on a diverse human population so you can understand the benefits and risks. And then uh, pretty much the field has known what those benefits and risks are at the time that it begins to be more broadly used within the public. And Maria and David, would you have anything to add um, to that? Yeah. Um... In, in case of IOVANS, and not to specifically focus on IOVANS, but this is a technology that has been around you know, for 30 years. Uh, we started with a non-genetically modified autologous T cells. And that was exactly the reason, because the, the off-target effects are expected to be minimal. And in fact, that's what we have been seeing. And again, this is a technology that has been around for a number of years. But I very much echo what Dave is saying, that once we start genetically modifying um, we have to make sure that we understand what is the consequence of those modifications. A second point, um, and I, I think this is very familiar to Berkeley, um, is the tool by which you use for genetic modification. Um, and the our tools are getting better and better. Of course, uh, the Berkeley team is familiar with CRISPR, uh, but there's various different tools that you can use. And the cleaner the tool is, the, the cleaner the expected adverse event profile is. In other words, as long as you don't hit other genes, um, unexpectedly and unanticipatedly, so you should not have um, too many off-target um, adverse events. Anything that is on target, that's what we ended up doing. That, that was the goal of this undertaking. So it's, it's important that we um, continue developing better tools, cleaner tools for genetic modification, but it is, it is something that we need to mind as we are thinking about genetic modification in general. To make the matters more complicated, 
when we modify human cells, there's not always a very good animal model to test it. So this is part of uh, what goes along with, with this uh, scientific landscape. We do need to make sure that we run our clinical trials uh, very carefully at the earlier stages of the development program. And David, do you have anything to add or? Um, I'll just add that from the gene editing perspective, the sort of CRISPR-Cas editing and looking at off targets, that, that's exactly what Acrogen is developing. So we are trying to develop those tools. So to answer the question, yeah, we take it uh, very seriously, and that's it's part of what we're, you know, problem we're trying to help solve. Um, but it is so, yeah. As a platform, that's that's our focus. Okay, great. Now here's another question from Marshall. Uh, you've talked about treating cancers, but what about chronic illness such as the seventy plus autoimmune diseases that appear to be DNA or family related? Any thoughts on that? Do you want me to take this one? Because I know I talked about cancer a few times, <laughs> so I'll take responsibility for that. Um, an excellent point, an excellent point. And um, I think cancer and autoimmune disorders are, are, should be, at least I think about them as two sides of the same coin. The reason we typically start with cancer is the bar is low. Uh, these are typically, unfortunately, patients that have uh, late line disease. It's easy to start with late line cancer patients. Uh, the regulatory hurdles are lower, the patients have no alternative therapies, they've usually run out of their options. And so we usually start with cancer because for practical matters and regulatory perspectives, it's easier to get started. But very much the same concept can and should be applied to autoimmune diseases. So I completely echo that. Anything else to add, Dave or David? Sure, I'll, um, so with, with autoimmune, as, as uh, Maria indicated, uh, this is a, these are a set of disorders in which the immune system overreacts um, and and begins to to attack self. Uh, and you know people have gotten a handle on some of the molecules, as Maria mentioned earlier, cytokines. Uh, so the, some of the molecules that mediate these these immune attacks on on oneself. And there are biologics, there are therapies out there right now that have the goal of inhibiting those those cytokines, those pro-inflammatory molecules. So, you know, Humira and Remicade were amongst the, the first uh, couple. These are um, antibodies or decoys designed to, to attack uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, which is one of these inflammatory molecules. And those drugs have had a you know, huge impact, actually, on rheumatoid arthritis. And now there are additional anti-cytokine therapies that are coming out to be able to treat conditions like psoriasis or, or eczema. One direction I'm particularly excited about is that these um, antibodies are typically you know, injected systemically into the bloodstream and can have, have side effects as a result because they're acting not just in, in say, the joints of one's legs where you would need them to be to, to protect against rheumatoid arthritis. They're having broad systemic effects. So the idea of local delivery or let's say local gene therapy where you can actually deliver the DNA encoding these, these inhibitors directly into the affected tissue raises the possibility that you could have a safe and efficacious therapy with a, with a safer profile. So I think these are just steps along the way towards engineering next generation therapies to be able to treat conditions you know, such as autoimmune disease. Yeah, and I'm seeing something similar in the antibody drug conjugate space where I, I mentioned earlier cytotoxins as the payload, um, but there's a number of groups and companies working on targeting um, other uh, drug moieties to, to tissues, like to, to joints and things like that. Um, and so there's a, a wave of conjugates that are moving outside of, of oncology. And again, I think you started with oncology because the bar was a little bit lower to Maria's point, but now you're starting to see a diversity of applications. And uh, you know, even in the Bay Area, there's a handful of companies that are working on this sort of targeted approach through um, developing cool conjugates, which is uh, pretty interesting. So let's turn to a question from uh, Todd here. It says, biology disease is so diverse. Do you see the potential for large application companies in life sciences? Will there be, will there be applications as large as Excel Word in life sciences? Who wants to go, uh, who wants to take a stab at that? I'll I'll go, I'll go because we pay the price for okay. sometimes it's painful not to have, yeah, not to have sufficient infrastructure. Um, 
I think one of the um, platforms that is missing as we are thinking about particularly cell and gene therapies, um, if we stay in the autologous space, is to identify patient's material. As we start with the patient material, the raw material may be a patient's tumor, a patient's blood, we send it to manufacturing facility, and then we need to be not 99.9%, .9%, but 100% sure what is coming back to the patient is their own material. And if you, you're doing five or six a month, that's fine. But if you're doing 10,000 of these a month, there better not be any errors. So in terms of platforms that are missing today, is the broad platform of what we call chain of identity or chain of custody software. And these are softwares that um, have to talk to a lot of other platforms within an organization to be able to say, I received the material. This is the same patient's material. It's in the manufacturing process. It's literally putting a GPS on that cells of the patients all the way through from the beginning all the way to the end. So it's that that's sort of a platform infrastructure that is actually a non-existing one. And a lot of companies are now entering this space trying to um, establish that. Of course, if you're doing an allogeneic, you may not need that degree of control, but I still think that um, it's a platform that is really in need of broad development for cell and gene therapy platforms. Dave or David, would you guys like to add something here? I guess I'll uh, probably just add, you know, 10 second comment that reinforces something that we talked about earlier which is data management early in the discovery process is becoming challenging. You know, if you're generating terabytes worth of data, it becomes really hard to store, organize, and especially visualize that. So there have been companies that have been coming out focused on, on uh, data visualization. And also, you know, once you can visualize it and, and process it, it adds on the, the capacity to do machine learning based on it. So I think that there are going to be software companies that focus on data archiving, storage, visualization, and, and learning. Yeah, I'll, I'll come at it from the, uh, the, the very downstream applications. So what you're seeing are, are large um, CROs or CDMOs building out really sophisticated manufacturing processes that can be plugged and played with different modalities which I think is pretty interesting. Um, we often don't think about that part because it's, it's, it's not maybe the discovery part, it's the actual building piece. Um, but uh, you know, you're seeing over the last 10 years, there's been tremendous growth, at least in the biologics and in the gene therapy manufacturing space where I think um, companies are getting very sophisticated and being able to like uh, sort of a plug and play approach for, you know, all these therapies coming in to make, you know, clinical batches and then eventually commercial batches, and they're getting much better at it. Um, uh, you know, if you look at how um, gene therapy manufacturing has evolved, it's, it's like it's been a rocket ship for the last five or six years and people are, are really piling a lot of money and resources into it. And I think, you know, the outcomes have been pretty, pretty encouraging. I don't know, Dave, if you want to add to that, because you're, I know you're right in the middle of that. <laughs> Sure. I think um, if I could, this touches a little bit on another question that's related that I saw um, from Brian Mayarella. Uh, Brian, um, I would say that a major limitation in the field has been, has been experienced in biologics manufacturing uh, within the gene therapy field, especially. Uh, gene therapy was a field that was strictly like 99% academic for about a period of 10 years until trials started working. And then companies started spinning out of academia to further clinically develop those, those trials. So process development and manufacturing knowledge and gene therapy was really almost non-existent um, outside of academia 10 to 15 years ago or so. So it's, it's gradually migrated into, into industry and become industrialized and, and professionalized. But I, I still think that there's a paucity of, of students who have experience in process development for these really complex biologics that we're trying to manufacture as a field now. And they're quite simply need to be you know, Genentech monoclonal antibody like improvements in manufacturing capacity in order to make uh, gene therapy and, and cell therapy as well available for, for large patient population uh, diseases that are, are much larger than the typical rare diseases that uh, the field of uh, gene therapy is taking on right now. So that's a, you know, it's, it's an opportunity, I think, for, for undergraduates and graduates at Berkeley and elsewhere. Let me actually pose that question to, because um, I think it's a fascinating question, and I think this might be our last question uh, that we could field probably before the, before the hour turns out. But uh, this is the question from Brian that, I, that, that Dave was touching on is, 
Are shortages of staff with specific expertise limiting the growth of your companies and industries? And what training should students interested in working in biotech seek out during this time? Um, I, yeah, there's absolutely a shortage of, of staff across all, like lots of disciplines. Um, you know, the, the, the biotech field in particular is, is growing very quickly. Um, I can speak for myself and for other maybe smaller startups. Uh, you know, we have to be very scrappy um, and very aggressive in our hiring right now because it's, it's, it's a, a, the biggest challenge that an entrepreneur faces right now is building their, their team um, and you're building it from scratch and getting in that kind of talent. Um, and finding talent, to Dave's point, that actually has some experience, maybe to mentor some of the other people, you know, finding that balance. Um, so, so uh, you know, we are constantly on the hunt for talent, um, and uh, I don't think we're unique. Um, and so, we're you know we're constantly exploring, uh, you know, ways to to work with uh, with a, a UC Berkeley or other universities to see if you know we can people can emerge out of out of the College of Chemistry with with a skill set that can be plugged into. Uh, a translational program relatively painlessly um, and uh, yeah anyway so that's from just coming from the startup perspective that's you know that's how I I see it I don't know what about you Maria why don't we go to you next uh, what do you see as kind of a you know the short fall of expertise that might be needed and what what could students focus on to be attractive in the uh, in the industry yeah absolutely um, there definitely is shortage of um, skilled um, team members. Um, and I can probably break it into two groups and let me focus on each one of them separately. One is management material. Um, and that's probably not particularly relevant if the question is, what can we do at Berkeley to have better um, team members coming in? Uh, management typically comes with someone who has a lot of experience in a field. But I think one of the things that I personally found particularly helpful is that um, analytical thinking and decision making. So that that actually is very much something that we teach in chemistry. This is incredible because that that thinking methodically thinking through a problem and thinking and how to solve all of that is is a way of thinking. It's not necessarily learning how to synthesize a compound, but it's more how to think about a problem. The second tier is I very much echo with what David is um, highlighting is the basic um, team members that we might use in a manufacturing facility or in our R&D lab. And I think what is really missing is a, a lot of basic immunology training, but at the same time, um, a septic process, so sterile techniques, is something that almost no one comes out of school knowing what is sterile technique. It's not something that is methodically trained. And a last item that is not methodically trained is GMP. Um, what, is, what is working in a GMP environment? So if I had to work with uh, Berkeley, and by the way, we have a manufacturing facility that we are building in Philadelphia. And so we are working with the Philadelphia um, schools, the, the network of graduate program as well as undergraduate program. These are things that we ask them to please include in their coursework and their training. Uh, we, 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 I mean, we train our team and we train them usually three to four months to just teach them basic aseptic skills and GMP manufacturing process. Um, I think those would be the two that I would highly encourage if there is an opportunity to add into the curriculum to be included. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, do you have any last thoughts to add on, on this? I, I fully agree with, with uh, um, my co-panelists. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll finish on a, a plug for the College of Chemistry, which is that uh, <laughs> Brian and others have, have uh, recently designed and are in the process of launching a new master's degree in bioprocess engineering. And so just to, to circle back to that, uh, that one skill set that I alluded to earlier, I think that that's really going to prepare students extremely well to start uh, entering into the workforce uh, with you know very modern biotech industry these days well unfortunately our time is up and our panel discussion on the panel discussion for the future of biotechnology is coming to an end so i wanted to first thank our three panelists for taking the time to share their knowledge and insights with us today also to thank all the participants uh, for virtually attending the panel discussion thank you for for joining us we look forward to connecting with you all again soon at future Berkeley Ecosystems events. Uh, we hope you to take care, stay well, 
and bye for now from Berkeley. Thank you.